Welcome everyone. My name is David Hemig. I'm with Matheson and I'm going to be your presenter today. With me is Corey Pitchler, our engineer. Also, we have Paulo Delazari, my counterpart for the Western region. I support the Eastern region for cabinet requirements. And we have some other folks from the factory as well, should they be needed. At the very end of this presentation, we will have some questions and answers. Our topic is gas cabinet systems. Our cabinets are made in the USA, manufactured in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania. So what are we gonna learn today? We're gonna learn how to identify when a cabinet system is needed for your application to ensure your process is safe. We're gonna learn about the features and benefits of cabinet systems. We're gonna learn about Matheson's capabilities, of course, and then we'll, we'll point you towards a couple resources and support options that you have available to you. Okay, so you think you need a cabinet. What do you need to consider? Well, first off, what is the name of your gas? That's gonna point you to the nature of the gas and it's gonna help you determine the complexity of the system you will require. Is the gas flammable, like hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide? And if flammable, how flammable? Is your gas toxic? Maybe it's like uh, nitric oxide, or maybe it's like arsine or phosphine, something where just a small whiff and you are compromised and possibly uh, heading to the hospital. Is your gas corrosive, meaning it's still dangerous to you, but with a little bit of moisture, it's gonna tear apart your regulator and your system downstream. What is your application? Petrochemical facilities have gas chromatograph rooms. They also need systems out in the plant, out in the weather. Are you doing pharmaceuticals? A lot of pharmaceuticals start with intermediates such as hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, corrosive gases needing sophisticated panels to keep the moisture out. If you're, maybe you have a room full of gas chromatographs or mass specs, well, maybe you wanna deliver that gas safely to that area. And if your technology is such that high purity is absolutely essential, such as semiconductor wafers, semiconductor research, or nanotechnology of some sort where you can't have particulates or impurities, in your gas, you need to know that as well. That's gonna point you toward the solution you require. And that, that ties into gas purity at the point of use. That determines whether you need a system that can do five nines, six nines, or greater gas purity to your point of use. Is your system gonna be indoors or outdoors? You need to know that because the cabinet enclosure needs to have the paint necessary to fend off the weather. A cabinet designed for the indoors, when put outdoors, is gonna rust. So you need a cabinet designed for the outdoors if you're putting it outdoors. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in the upcoming material. <clears throat> Let's look at our indoor cabinet. Indoor cabinets are typically one, two, or three cylinder enclosures. The spec for, for material of the cabinet to be made of is 12 gauge. You need an automatic door closure. So when you walk away from the cabinet, it closes without your assistance. And that's obviously a safety feature. The top panel right here, you can see behind this sprinkler head, we have a removable panel. And that's because when you outfit your cabinet with panels or manifolds, the gas line will run out the top. And if if you're trying to line up those holes, it's much easier to do those drill throughs if you can remove the panel and do that on a bench top. So a removable top panel is a nice thing. How about a flat top roof of your cabinet? Well, the reason that's important is because you need to mount things up here like controllers and controllers are mounted on brackets. It's much easier to do that on a flat top. 
than a cone top. Some cabinets, you'll see you have cone tops. Not as easy to put stuff up top. And well, I'll show you examples where you need things up top. The sprinkler head, well, there it is right there. What about cylinder restraints? Well, these are standard in our cabinets. They're mounted right on those U-channel runs right up and down the cabinet. The protruding latch, why is that important? Well, you don't want people catching on it as they, they go by. It needs to be flush with the cabinet for safety. Lockable access panel. Well, you want to be able to lock that thing. You don't want anyone to walk up to your cabinet in its chase or wherever you have it installed and be able to access the dangerous gas inside and the system that you have to get that gas safely from the cylinder to the point of use. The paint. Indoors, well, a nice business-like gray we think works best. That's our standard. You can have any color, but you probably want it to be neutral so it doesn't stand out or shock you as you walk in the room or alley or chase. A low profile. Well, why is that important? Cylinders are heavy. So it should be about an inch because it has to go over that lip. Of course, if it's a liquefied gas, it'll be on a scale and you'll have a ramp. So you'll roll that cylinder right up and onto the scale. But the, uh, for just a compressed gas, you need to just bring it up over that one inch lip. The louver, this is an important feature of your cabinet. The air from the room goes in and then out the exhaust. That's how you get that code required 200 foot per minute across an open access window. You gotta have that airflow through the cabinet. And the cabinet is designed to allow that flow to occur. The U-channels supports, I mentioned that, the panels and the cylinder strains all mounted on that. We designed Article 80 Uniform Fire Code. And then I'm gonna talk about some options on the next page to include the fusible link and shelf. Here's the, the floor, it needs to be durable, of course, and that is a uh, removable floor. So you would mount the cabinet underneath this panel with mounting holes that you would uh, attach to your floor or concrete pad or whatever. Cabinet options. Well, maybe you want more than just the strap. So you add a chain. There's your uh, strap and also a chain. So two cylinder restraints. Maybe you have a dusty room. So you need a diffuser plate with a filter. So you get that dust out of the cabinet before sending it up the exhaust. A controller. I'm gonna show you controllers, but there you go. That's what I mean by the flat top, the, the, the angle bracket right here. And you look up at your controller like that and interface with your controller. You got a fire, you wanna cut off oxygen to the cabinet. We do that with what's called a fusible link. Here's your fuse, it senses temperature and drops this guillotine-like structure over the air intake, cutting off oxygen to your fire. If your exhaust stack has failed, you need to know that. Here is a visible gauge telling you if your exhaust draw is sufficient. Your dial is gonna be at your water column mark telling you what kind of exhaust you're pulling. And if you see it down here at zero, you've got a problem. And if you do have a problem, you want a pressure switch. Right here is the, the uh, unit for the pressure switch. You can see the probe going in your exhaust stack. If your exhaust fails, you wanna send a signal to this ESO controller and shutting off a valve. And I'll show you that in the next page as well. Here is a shelf. If you got a small cylinder, you want it up off the floor and you use this strap to keep the cylinder in place. So a shelf mounted on the uni Unistrat uh, runs in the cabinet. All right, on this slide, I wanna show you just a couple of things. This is a cabinet designed for the outdoors. It's our hard hat cabinet. What do you need for that? Well, you need a rain gutter. You got to disperse the moisture as it falls on your cabinet. We you have a rain gutter. You need stainless steel hinges and hardware so the door doesn't rust to the point where it can't operate. And then you need aircraft like paint. It's got to be painted so that it holds up in the weather. And then finally, if it's a dangerous gas, even if it's outdoors, you should run your exhaust ductwork. But if it's not a dangerous gas and you just want it to be outside and you don't want to run the exhaust, we'll give you a Tin Man hat. I don't know if that looks like a Tin Man hat, but well, it probably would be a better drawing if I did 
that, a Tin Man hat up there. So you have something to keep the moisture from falling inside your cabinet. The controller, very important part of your system and will determine the complexity of your system. Let's look at the type of sensors you might include in your cabinet system. What if you've got oh, a break in the line downstream of the cabinet? You're gonna have flow beyond what you're planning for. It's an excess flow condition. Use an excess flow switch that for that, made by Swagelock. And that is gonna land here in your controller. This controller, its whole purpose in life is either to let this valve stay open or closed. It does that by delivering air to the valve if it wants it to be open. But if there's a problem and say you get an excess flow condition, it's gonna sense that from your sensor and it's gonna cut off air to the valve, closing the system at the cylinder or on the high pressure side of the regulator. So you don't have to go running to your cabinet system, opening the hatch and closing the cylinder valve. It does it automatically. And now you can deal with your problem. Okay, exhaust fail. Well, pressure switch in the exhaust stack and that lands right there. Gas detection. You might have two levels of gas detection. You might have a tiny leak that your cabinet exhaust can handle. Maybe you don't wanna shut the system down. So it's a warning. But then maybe the leak gets dramatic and you want the system to shut down that valve to close. This would be an example of your gas detection. Your sensor could be this type, communicating directly with the ESO controller, the emergency shutoff controller, or you could have a controller it talks to and that in turn sends a signal to your ESO controller. What about low cylinder contents or high delivery pressure or pressure line containment? Well, that could be for a a completely compressed gas cylinder, that's a pressure, a pressure transducer or device sending a signal to either high delivery pressure, process line containment, your process line is lost pressure, meaning there's a rupture, or for the low cylinder, if it's a completely compressed cylinder, compressed gas cylinder, you could land there. But if it's a liquefied compressed gas, then you're gonna be measuring weight and this the signal is going to come from the controller of the scale to your low cylinder. What if you want to start your system remotely? Well, you do a remote start, lands there, starts things open, opens this valve, it can run. Or what if you want to be, what if you want to shut it down from another room? Well, you got a shutdown button, ties in there. The ESO controller, essential for making sure your system is safe. Now let's talk about the panels that you can integrate into your system. We're not really gonna play tic-tac-toe, it just is a catchy phrase we thought would uh, grab your attention. So now let's go look at the panels. We have them all lined up, let's see here. Our PAN 5000 panel. This is a nice panel for research, high purity as well. The one valve panel, you can see that's really just like a regulator with an outlet valve, but it's designed so you mount it on those U-channel runs in the cabinet. It's appropriate for inerts. What if you've got hydrogen you're feeding to a gas chromatograph room? Well, this might be the panel you want, all right? So hydrogen's not so expensive that you wouldn't want to vent a little bit of it out. So here is a vent purge module. Close this valve right here by making it perpendicular. And then when you do your cylinder change out, you send your first few slugs out the vent. And you do that by opening and closing this valve. This valve is open when it's parallel to the, to the vent line, it's closed when it's perpendicular. When you've done all that and you're ready to go, you open this valve like there, keep this one closed and your gas flow path goes through the regulator, through your LPI valve, low pressure isolation valve to your point of use. There is a pressure relief function here as well. Should your regulator have a problem, a particulate on the seat, and you get creep, it will send it out the relief valve to your vent. Okay, now what if you get one of those dangerous gases where 50 part per million will injure you, maybe kill you, or if you've got a corrosive gas where you have to keep moisture out of the system, you need to add a cross purge feature on the inlet of your panel, our five valve panel does that. You can see here's your purge gas inlet, here is your vent valve, and then your high pressure isolation on the high pressure side of the regulator. The flow path through this panel is up through the regulator, out through the LPI, 
And when you have that corrosive gas, well, before you do cylinder change out, you may need to fill and evacuate nitrogen into the space up to 60 times. Yes, believe it or not, up to 60 times. Once you've done that, now you close this valve, you keep this closed, now your nitrogen comes down, down your pigtail and flows out towards your cylinder in a pigtail bleed. You change out the cylinder, and now you want to vent the first slug, because, well, with the corrosive gas, you want to send that out the vent. So you need to cycle that a few times before closing the valve, opening this valve, keeping this closed, running your gas through the regulator to your point of use. Removing moisture is going to save your regulator and it's gonna save your system downstream because moisture and a corrosive gas will destroy everything. And so you need to be aware of that. So don't do shortcuts. All right, let me return to, okay. Five valve panel with cross perch feature. Let's take a look at these systems installed. We went through how they work in a lot of detail, but let's show you a few of the features integrated in. Here's your ESO valve on the high pressure side of the regulator. Here is an excess flow switch on the downstream side. It's going to sense if there's a break down here or at your point of use that has that high flow condition. You know there's an ESO controller because you got this feature right here. You might have other features as well. And their whole purpose is to either let air come to this valve or to deny air. When air is cut off, this valve closes. And now you can deal with your problem in a nice calm way rather than running to your cabinet and closing your cylinder valve. Let's look at a five valve panel. A lot going on here. You can see they can get pretty fancy. This is paired with a dedicated purge panel, nitrogen panel, a one valve panel. The nitrogen gas goes out here and into your purge gas inlet of your five valve panel. This panel's got an ESO valve. It's got an excess flow switch. Even has a rotometer, which we manufacture. We blow the glass, etc. The inlet goes in here, out the back, and then it's gonna go out the top of the cabinet, as I mentioned. One other feature you should see is this Venturi that provides you enhanced purging. This is nitrogen that comes across. Here's a valve, that Venturi valve that either allows you to use this feature or not. And it gives you enhanced purging on your panel, especially if you wanna purge downstream of your panel. All right, there you go, five valve paired with a one valve in a cabinet. Okay, let's look at a switchover system with a lot of the features that we talked about for safety. Here is a standoff view, same system that's over here. There are the two process panels that are going to be in switchover configuration. And here is a dedicated purge panel. Here is your ESO controller. Here's your switchover controller. Here's your magnihelic monitoring exhaust. This is in our cabinet or in our factory, of course, so it's not all hooked up. But let's take a look at the system itself. We know what those are. Those are the ESO valves. But look, you have air actuated valves up here. Basically, the switchover controller is saying, side A, you're looking good. Based on the data we have, your cylinder is full. You deliver to the point of use up the top of the cabinet. When this cylinder goes empty, it recognizes that, closes this valve, opens this valve, and now side B is going to your point of use. Whole purpose of that, that controller right there, decide which side gets to, to deliver. And while you're delivering on side B, you change out cylinder A, it goes on and on and on. See here, here's a gas detector looking for a leak. If it senses anything down here, it's gonna send a signal here, shutting these valves. There you go, a lot of those features integrated in to the cabinet. What if you're doing research that requires high purity? Well, now you need a panel designed for high purity. Key difference is you need all welded and all VCRs for your connections. VCRs need to be supported. That's the one thing about VCR connections. They need to be supported. So you need that bracket to make sure that torquing doesn't loosen it. But there's a gasket in the middle of that connection and it's a very pure connection. It enables greater than six nines purity to your point of use. Panels we discussed prior, they do six nines and they use uh, swage lock and threads and welds. 
These are all VCR, all welds. Here you have a single stage regulator. You may need a steady delivery pressure. And we did a whole thing on regulators not too long ago talking about the value of a dual stage regulator. So I won't repeat that, but dual stage regulators give you a steady delivery pressure. What if you need to purge out that moisture or you can't afford to sniff 10 part per million like arsine or phosphine? Well, you need this cross feature. Feature. Look, here it is again. Your purge gas inlet, your vent, your high pressure isolation valve, and there's your LPI. So a high purity panel. And now let's take a look at this panel in action. Here we go. Here's the 9400 series panel installed at this customer in Illinois, in the Chicago area. Here's his ESO controller. Here's his gas detector. He's got probes in the cabinet, in the cabinet exhaust. Here are his scale controllers, because these are, I'll show you in the next picture, these are liquefied gases, so you need to know weight in order to know when you're almost empty. He's got mass flow, so he's got a mass flow controller as well. You can see his two gases are chlorine and HCl. So he's serving two gases that are alike in the same cabinet. They're corrosive, so they can be in the same cabinet. And you can see that he's got an excess flow switch there and there. He's got an ESO valve there and there. Here are his mass flow devices. These are not the rotameter type. These are the, the digital type where he's gonna set his flow to his point of use. These are corrosive liquefied gases. So he needs a scale. There's the scale. And these are smaller cylinders. It's tough to see, but they're sitting on a shelf. You can just barely make it out there. All right, a lot going on with a 9400 panel, and uh, he's able to do two gases, corrosive, with a lot of sophistication. His gas detection sensors are over here. You can't see them, and they, um, or his um, uh, horn and strobe, I should say. Here are his detectors, but they're communicating with a control box that monitor and then send back to the ESO controller. Should, should he reach a leak where he wants to shut things down? What if you just want to be cost effective and you want to switch over and you want it in a cabinet? Maybe you're dealing with hydrogen, flammability range all the way up to 75%, 4% to 75%. That's dangerous. Methane, still flammable in a little lesser range. Maybe that's the gas you're dealing with. Or maybe you got a hydrocarbon and you think you need a switch over. Well, they're all pressure differential. We did a whole session on those as well. So I won't really dwell on it, only to say, that basically one side delivers, the other is waiting patiently for this side to run empty and takes over up through the line regulator to your point of use. If it's low pressure, well, say you're delivering 40 to 60 PSI and you've got propane, you need something like this. A little different animal, but still pressure differential. The switchover occurs automatic. What if you need something equivalent to 15 CFM nitrogen? Now you need one of these animals. So maybe you need that in a cabinet as well. So you would use a panel like this. So now let's look at these in cabinets. Let's look at the LPX. This customer, pharmaceutical company, is using perfluoropropane. That's a low pressure cylinder. How, how'd they do the automatic switchover? With the LPX. You can see it's pretty fancy, but this valve kind of tells you that's the family it's from. It's going up through this regulator to the point of use. He's got ESO. Here's the controller. The pressure differential system goes on and on and on. Here's our standard switchover in a cabinet. Let's take a brief look at this. It's got a couple very nice features here. Might be, well, this is probably easier to see. Here's a cross purge in a pressure differential switchover. This is in our factory. So here is the combined vent. It's going to go out through the top of the cabinet once it's situated in the field. And here is, um, here is an ESO valve, tough to see, but easier to see in this picture. So you actually have a GSM-12 as well. And then here's your pressure monitor. All right, so hydrogen switchover, standard system with a dedicated purge panel, because they don't want to use their house nitrogen or anything like that for the cross purge feature. All right, let's say we want to get really cost effective, but we want that regulator off the cylinder. Why do you want the regulator off the cylinder? Because that's how regulators get damaged. And if you think about it, if you have a cabinet system, 
and your regulators coming off this nine o'clock port here on the single station manifold, you got process lines that are running out the top of the cabinet. You don't want to be holding the regulator so it doesn't stress your process line when you do cylinder change out. So you put it up here on this circular four port manifold, 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock. Put your regulator there, cylinder connects here. And when you do cylinder change out, you're only operating with the flex hose or the pigtail. You're not stressing your regulator. You're not stressing your line. It's a better way to do it. And it is cost effective. What if you've got a corrosive gas and you wanna stay cost effective? Here is a cross purge feature. I'm gonna show you that in an uh, upcoming slide, so I won't dwell on it here, but talk about efficiency, cross purge with a single station manifold, also known as a protocol station. Well, if you just want additional capacity, well, put two cylinders on a two station manifold, each isolated with a station valve. That's getting pretty simple. And I'll show you a picture of that as well. So now let's go. Here are some nice pictures. This customer, he processes gold jewelry. They use ammonia for that. And I covered up the placard there, but you can see it here, same system. He's got his gas detection mounted on the sidewall with his, with his uh, light to tell him when he's got a leak. He's got his scale because ammonia is a liquefied gas. He's got his controller up here and he's got his ESO controller because he wants to shut things down if gas is leaking outside the cabinet. And he does it with that valve right there. Here comes his purge gas down into the 12 o'clock port. Look at that, there's your purge gas in that. It's closed right now, but you put it in line with the line and it's open and here's his vent. So he fills and vents, fills and vents. And he does that multiple times because it's ammonia, all right? If it's the gas is a little less dangerous or, or corrosive, you can do that less times, but you need to fill and evacuate. Once you've done that, you've changed out your cylinder and you've vented your uh, first slugs of ammonia at the vent. Now you close this down, open up this valve. Now it runs through your regulator to your jewelry processing chamber. This customer at a chemical facility out in Northern California, he's got a three cylinder source track mounted in a cabinet. Isolates three valves with that station valve. Here's another cabinet, different cabinet with three station valves. Remember our online store, because that's where these links are. They're awesome links. You wanna look at the one on gas cabinets? It's store.mathesongas.com. Go to the gas cabinet area. And if you wanna see how the 5500 panel works with its cross purge feature and its low pressure vents and all that, then go to the 5500 series area and look at that video as well. Okay, so what did we learn today? We learned how to identify when a cabinet system is needed for an application so that your installation is safe. We learned about features and benefits you can integrate into your gas cabinet system. We learned about Matheson's capabilities because that's what I was using to show you what is possible. And we, I pointed out in the prior slide, you can go to our online store and look at the resources and support that you can access that will educate you. So we are at the point of the presentation now where we have several questions that you guys submitted. So Corey, if you could join me now, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, first question is from Amy. What is the purpose of bolting a gas cabinet to the floor? Once a cabinet is in place and you connect everything to it, just like the exhaust or hard pipe for the, you know, the outlet of the gas, the cabinet should be bolted down to prevent movement so that you could possibly, so because you could possibly break the connections. Thank you. Steve had this to, to ask. How important is it to achieve the required exhaust flow from the gas cabinet? It's important because that's what it's needed to keep the gas from accumulating if the cylinder leaks or a connection leaks for any reason. So you wanna keep that accumulation from happening. Okay, and so that's how they achieve that 200 foot per minute across the access port if the exhaust yeah. is properly done? Correct. All right, thank you. What is the purpose of the access window on a gas cabinet. You look through the window, you see the system gauges, possibly you have a switch over in there, so you, the switch over arrow might need to be moved and so you can reach in without opening the entire cabinet and then you'll disrupt the exhaust going through it as well. And okay, thank you. From 
Dave, is a gas cabinet ever appropriate for inert gases such as nitrogen or argon? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, depending on the environment, sometimes you want to protect your cylinders. And of course, there's always the, the threat of confined spaces for nitrogen and argon where asphyxiation can occur if, if something were to leak. If the gas cabinet is installed outdoors, is it necessary to run exhaust ductwork from the cabinet? Well, it, uh, it all depends on the gas you're putting in there. Um, you probably don't need it if you have a, a an inert gas, but for uh, other gases, you probably want it because, again, the accumulation could happen. And outdoors, it's, the, it's not going to get inside the cabinet any air, not, not enough airflow at least, to bring it out the exhaust. So you definitely want to have the exhaust on there to keep the gases from accumulating. All right, thank you. Is it recommended to use house nitrogen as a purge gas source for a gas cabinet designed for hazardous gas delivery rather than a dedicated nitrogen cylinder? You should use a dedicated N2 cylinder. Um, fortunately, house gas may not be clean enough when it comes to the moisture in it, particulates, and then even oxygen. So it might not be pure enough to do the purge. All right, thank you. Okay, Paulo, were there any questions in the uh, chat box? Yes, David. The next question is from Knowles. The building compressed air system goes down for maintenance, for example. Does the ESO automatically fail close or is there an override? Uh, yes, the ESO will fail close and there is no override. Yes, the next question is from uh, Tyler. We have a clean room that needs constant monitoring over the internet and connected to an alarm system. Do you offer that kind of a system? Corey, I can probably feel that. Yes, yeah, you can yeah. do that. That's the high end. Uh, high-end systems that has the ethernet or communication features, so yes. The second, yeah, I, should, the next oh, I should add, I should add those systems are entire, it's like a whole presentation to themselves. So we, that, that can be, maybe be in the future. Go ahead. Next question is from uh, Mike. Uh, what are the uh, recommendations for mounting the cabinet onto the floor? Lag bolts into the, you know, you drill it into it. You put the, you know, if it's concrete, you put the concrete screws into it and uh, that would be the best way to do it with lag bolts so corey there are um if you remove the floor there are the four bolt holes correct yes and then yeah so i mean it all depends on what you're bolting it to as well okay very good hey dave there there is one more question um oh, that just ahead, came Mike. in yeah so that is is the water sprinkler head from the building fire system um or can it be uh from the potable system so, uh, you know, what's the source of the water going to the sprinkler head? You know, can you use your potable system, water system in your, in your building, or does it need to be a wet, you know, sprinkler system, water supply? Can be whatever is convenient for you to hook up and, and provide what's needed for that sprinkler. Now, I, I believe there's a certain rating too, Corey, yes. uh, the yes. minimum pressure and mm -hmm. some minimum flow rate to make yes. the system, you know, rated. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, that's, and that's what I meant. As, as long as it reaches the minimum requirements, but yes, that's yeah. To be get more specific, yep. there's a minimum pressure, minimum flow rate. Okay. And, and, the fire, and the fire marshal may have some requirements that they impose. Yes, that that is a good point, Mike. There there are always local fire codes as well that we cannot plan for. So you should always have a fire marshal come in. So with that, I'm going to end the show, and uh, thank you very much for joining us.